welcome to NASDAQ channel special interviews. So it's our great honor to have a Nobel laureate, Professor Yuan T. Lee, to, to join our uh, interviews today. So Professor Lee uh, got, is a, uh, got his uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1986. Yes. Uh, for his contributions concerning the dynamics of chemical elementary processes. Yes. That's right? That's right. Okay. So we have some questions mm -hmm. uh, that we, we hope that we, uh, your answer will inspire the young generation. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first, the first one we, we want to ask you, uh, what, what do you love the most about science and research? Well, mm -hmm. when you do scientific research, yes. we only try to find something nobody knew before. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting Yes. When you're young, you try to learn everything. That's right. But learning everything will not make science to progress uh -huh. until one day mm -hmm. you find out somebody who has said before turned out to be wrong. Oh. And if you tell your teacher that you're wrong, <laughs> I found a new, yeah. new way to explain things. Mm -hmm. That's the moment science will make progress. Oh. So the thing which excites me most is to try to do something Mm -hmm. People think it's impossible mm -hmm. or find something nobody know before. And that's the most exciting part of science. So this is very exciting for you. Yes. So, uh, so how, how you come up with a good question for research? Well, that's a, a good question. Mm -hmm. When you're young, yes. you are learning science with your advisor. Mm -hmm. So the advisor will try to tell you do certain things. Mm -hmm. So you work together. Yeah. But gradually, you move into a mode that the professor would not know mm -hmm. the answer. And so they will come and ask you, what's new? Mm -hmm. What you have done? Yeah. What are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. And in that process, you will find that they, oh, there are some questions really need to be answered. So when scientists develop, then you come up with idea. So many young people said, Professor Lee, I don't have any idea. How can I be a scientist? Mm -hmm. I said, no, you should not have great idea mm -hmm. when you're so young. Mm -hmm. But when you learn to answer some of the questions, mm -hmm. then problem will come to you. And suddenly you find ah, this interesting, important thing you need to answer. And then mm -hmm. you come up with idea to pursue it. Oh, so sorry. that is really need, something need to be developed. So you, you say normally we, we got some good questions after right. we do some research. That's right. Practicing. You keep on asking questions, ah. asking very innocent questions. Mm -hmm. Then gradually you will find important questions That's right. along the way. That's right. Okay. So what is your impact or contribution of your research to the world? Well, <laughs> <laughs> mm, very often, yeah. uh, people in the government will ask, what have you done? Yes. How much you have contributed? Yes, always. Actually, if you look at the PhD thesis of my students, mm -hmm. all bookshelves of mm -hmm. the, the thesis, mm -hmm. and you ask the question, how much technology transfer mm -hmm. you made and made some income for your organization? I said, no, mm -hmm. I'm doing fundamental research. But the important thing is, all the students mm -hmm. are educated. Mm -hmm. After they go PhD, yes. about one third of them will go to industry. Oh. And when they go to industry, for example, yes. long time ago, mm -hmm. IBM is moving into copper surface, mm -hmm. copper, and they have some program of getting copper to stick on the surface. Yes. And one of my postdoctoral fellow went there, mm -hmm. and he eventually became a director of research at IBM. Wow. He solved the problems for okay. them. So one thing is we educate people and bring the knowledge yes. and bring the ability to answer questions to the industry. And that is the way we are contributing. And about one third of this, my students will become, a, become university professors. Yes. Actually, uh, during the time I was in the United States, among the research university, 
I produce more professors than anybody else in the oh, United States. Wow. <laughs> and so those students will bring the next generation of students, mm -hmm. they carry out some research. Mm -hmm. And so those are another pathways. And yes. one third of my students will go to the uh, government research laboratory or um, some basic research institute and mm -hmm. continue on to do research. So if you look at the accumulation of what we have done, yes. we made some mm -hmm. contributions, but in a very indirect way. Yeah. Some of the people are different. They produce the science and technology, yes. and through innovation, they transform into some productivity in the society mm -hmm. and bring lots of money, yes. bring lots of money. But I think this cycle goes through science and development of science mm -hmm. and technology will take a long way. And sometimes somebody mm -hmm. will use that to transform into mm -hmm. productivity in the society. But the cycle sometimes small, sometimes long. Mm -hmm. And if you ask, for example, when the semiconductor yeah. transistor was invented, mm -hmm. nobody really realized it was going to change the entire world. Or oh, Einstein suggested general theory of relativity. Right. It's a great impact. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little worried at the present time. Many governments are really too short-sighted and give you money mm -hmm. and see some return immediately. Mm -hmm. But that's really not a good thing. They are always request for some products. Right. They, they and cannot see any significant of the, the, the importance of the basic resource. That's right. Because mm -hmm. as I said, scientists has the responsibility to find the knowledge mm -hmm. and develop the new technology. And somebody will be able to use it yeah. to, through the innovation, turn into the product. Yeah. Right? But that cycle sometimes is short, sometimes long. Yeah. And you really have to take care of yes. everything. Yes. I agree with you on that. Mm. Uh, anyway, how to make uh, an ordinary student to become a good scientist? Actually, I did find the students are all very good scientists. Mm -hmm. They ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. It's the older generation intimidated them and said, mm. Sci uh, children supposed to be quiet. Don't ask so many questions, oh. or you ask stupid questions oh. and intimidating them. Mm -hmm. So, I think if you look at the young kid in the school, mm -hmm. you really should keep the curiosity going and allow them to ask many, many questions. Mm -hmm. So, certainly you can ask youngster some question and challenge them and stimulate, stimulate mm -hmm. their thinking. My mother. When I was young, yeah. she always challenged me with many things. Oh. Like something's broken, yeah. asked me to fix, fix it. Oh. And sometimes she didn't know the answer. Mm -hmm. She asked me uh, some questions. Of course, I didn't know the answer. Mm -hmm. But I'm a good kid. I tried to satisfy my mother. Uh -huh. So I always tried to find some answer uh, to see whether some of the answer could be true. Oh. So. I would say that the youngsters are usually very curious mm -hmm. and we can stimulate their thinking and ask them to always ask good questions. Yes. Don't in intimidate them and say, you're a good student, you should be quiet, listen to me, get a good grade. Mm -hmm. That's really not the way. So it, it, it's uh, in the other way. So the That's people right. must keep the, the natures of uh, curiosity. The right, and that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, as a scientist, so you, you know science uh, mm -hmm. make an uh, impact to the world. Mm -hmm. Anyway, how, how to convince, especially uh, the politician or, or many influencer to believe that we, we can sh make a better world, to change the world. Yeah. Like, like you mentioned this morning yeah. about the situation, about the climate change, yeah. something like that. Well, yeah. it's interesting. I used to see, think that the many politicians or mm -hmm. people in society 
which are not related to the science and technology, I thought they really do not understand science. That's why they made the wrong decision of thinking differently. But it turns out to be that's not quite true. Mm -hmm. They are not dumb. Yeah. They are not dumb. No. They, they, yeah, no. they really know quite a bit about science. But very often, it's for their own interest. So US National Academy of Sciences looked at the, all the congressmen, mm -hmm. and they said, yes, some of them do not understand science. Mm -hmm. But many of them feel that they, if you mess up the economy, people will be really suffer more. So they do not I want see. to change. And some of the people are for their own interest. But on the other hand, it is true that the, if you look at the university education, mm -hmm. very often students in the literature, social sciences, did not learn enough science. Mm -hmm. So when I became a professor at the University of Chicago, yeah. during the first year, mm -hmm. the second semester, mm -hmm. department chairman said, Professor Lee, you have to teach science for non-scientists. The second semester is about chemistry. In University of Chicago, they take the core education very seriously. So I come to the classroom and start to teach. And those students used to read the book and write some impression and report. And so when I start to talk about conservation of energy, they understand and conservation of energy. But when you go to the second law of thermodynamics of entropy, you raise your hand and say, yeah. Professor Lee, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I said, it's not for you to say it doesn't make sense. Huh. You have to understand first. Uh -huh. Then I have to start with the probability and what's going mm -hmm. on. It takes some effort to teach no. science to non-scientists, yeah. but it's possible. possible. We have a laboratory. And for example, when I was doing electrolysis of water, and students see hydrogen to oxygen is two to one. Mm -hmm. And a young student looked at me and said, Professor, you're lucky. I said, what do you mean I'm lucky? He said, you said two to one, and it's two to one. You're lucky. <laughs> so she was challenged me to, to do it again. Mm -hmm. So I said, I did it again, and two to one. So she said, you're lucky again. <laughs> Why don't you try again? I said, try three times. And she was puzzled. She said, you scientists always know, you know exactly what's going on. I said, yes, in the electrolysis, I know what's going on, mm -hmm. how the electrons transfer, produce hydrogen, oxygen. Mm -hmm. When I explained it, she said, do you use computer? I said, yes. Did weather forecast use computer? I said, yes. Then she said, where the focus said it's going to rain today, but it's not raining. Mm -hmm. So she mixed up uh, some exact sciences mm -hmm. and complex phenomena yeah. involve many elements which we did not really handle exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to explain many, many things. At the end of the semester, mm -hmm. students were so happy <laughs> and came and said, Professor Lee, the person who worked with you, another professor, mm -hmm. He is awful. Could you fire him? <laughs> I said, no, he's the department chairman. <laughs> he can fire me, but I cannot fire him. But I have a very good experience. You're right. I think we really need to educate everybody to understand science. And it is possible yeah. to educate them. That's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. and, and that we can. Yes, yes, the, we can. Uh, yeah, and the main part is we need to communicate yes, with each other. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Well, Professor, my pleasure. For a very yes, inspiring talk. Thank you. So, hope you, you feel okay. inspiring too. Swadikap. <laughs> Swadikap. <laughs>